It's the year 2126. These days, people play hyper-realistic MMORPG game called the Yggdrasil. However, this game was coming to an end. While almost all players had started to leave the game one by one, a high-ranking player and the leader of the most feared guild, Ains Ul Gaon, named Momonga, with an undead avatar, is one of the very few who decides to stay back along with his teammate Hiro Hiro. Momonga has always been a massive fan of the game, and feels gutted that despite all the fun and joy that the game had brought, it was finally coming to an end. After a few minutes of chatting, however, Hiro Hiro logs out of the game as well. After spending so much time together and creating this unbeatable guild, all 41 members except Momonga had left the game, and finally, today, after 12, he would be leaving as well. After parting with Hiro Hiro, Momonga grabs onto the guild's main weapon and heads into the other room where a group of NPCs are waiting for his command. He orders them to follow him into the throne room of the guild. There, right beside this throne, stands the prettiest and strongest NPC among them all, Albedo. With not much time left for the game's conclusion, Momonga decides to mess with the source code of the NPCs a little bit. He takes a look at Albedo's code and decides to make her super attracted to him while he is at it. Then, Momonga sits himself down and takes one glance at his grand guild and closes his eyes as the clock strikes 12. When he opens his eyes again, Momonga has still not been logged out of the game. Something was wrong. He quickly tries to test the messages manually and log out from the game, but it doesn't seem to work. Momonga starts to get agitated, and to add to his surprise, Albedo speaks to him and asks him what was wrong. Momonga stares her down. She seemed so real and, more importantly, unlike the game, her mouth was moving. She was actually talking to him and everything about her seems to be hyper-realistic. Momonga gets up astonished, but then, suddenly, a strange green light calms him down. He then sends one of the NPCs, Sebas, a leader among the guard NPCs of the guild hall, to check the surrounding area. He notes that the NPCs could now take commands without having to use specific game keywords from the game. He had most definitely isekai'd into another world. However, Momonga had to be absolutely sure, and after sending away the battle maid NPCs to guard the rest of the floor, he calls Albedo next to him. He immediately realizes that she feels real, and even has her own smell, but one final test was in order. He asks Albedo, as calmly as he can, if he can touch her chest, and the girl, who is most definitely crazily in love with him, agrees to let him have his way. Momonga goes for it and grabs her, concluding that, yes, everything and everyone around him was real. He then excuses himself and asks Albedo to gather all the Guardian NPC from all floors of their guild except the 1st, 4th, and 8th floor Guardians to the fighting arena on the 6th floor. He then heads to the arena himself and meets up with the Guardians of the 6th floor, two cross-dressing Dark Elves, Mare and Aura. Momonga decides that, while he is there, he should also test the extent of his magic. He summons a huge level 80 magical beast. The thing roars like a literal demon, but Momonga can't be bothered to fight it, and instead lets the two kids handle the business. Just as the elves are done with the elemental demon, the floor guardians of Nazarick enter the arena and introduce themselves one by one. Guardian of the first, second, and third floor, Shaltir Bloodfallen, a true vampire, Coctius, the guardian of the fifth floor, who, Momonga tells, is the definition of the warrior. Demiurge, the guardian of the seventh floor, a true demon, and finally Albedo, the overseer of the floor guardians. One by one, in order to assert his dominance in the presence of such powerful beings, Momonga makes them pledge loyalty to him. The guardians are surprisingly super loyal to their master, just like they were programmed in the game, which makes life so much easier for Momonga. The undead leader is pleased with their vows of loyalty, but is suddenly notified by Sebus that their guild, the Great Tomb of Nazarick, has been entirely teleported to an unknown land outside of Yggdrasil. Astonished at this sudden change, Momonga asks the Guardians to start strengthening their defenses and requests Mare to use his earth magic to blend the Great Tomb of Nazarick into the surrounding area. He then gives the Guardians their respective orders and leaves. In his private chambers, Momonga sits down, realizing that most of the mechanics from the game still applied to him. Since he was an undead, he had no feelings, and since he had his class set as a magician in the game, he could no longer use any physical weapons. However, there was a way to bypass this rule. He uses armor to temporarily set himself as a warrior class, and this gives him the ability to use weapons. Mission success! 
Momonga then heads outside to take a look for himself at the new world that he was transported to. However, he is followed by Demiurge, who listens to every word Momonga says. While talking to himself, Momonga mumbles how world domination would be a fun idea in a new world. Unfortunately for him, Demiurge hears all this and already has a plan cooking in his head. Momonga then descends upon his great palace, which is now completely covered in dirt and vegetation thanks to Mare. Pleased with his subjects, he hands Mare the guild ring which gives her access to the entire palace through teleportation. There is a slight issue of morality though when Albedo shows up and he has to give one ring to her as well, just so that she wouldn't go into a frenzy. Not only that Demiurge is there as well, and he has to be given a ring as well. That's a lot of micromanagement right there. Elsewhere though, something, or rather someone crazy, is scheming up another evil plan. Back at the Nazarick, while using his magic mirror, Momonga stumbles upon a village named Karn, which is being attacked by some unknown knights. Since Momonga has started to transform mentally into an undead as well, at first he finds no empathy for the humans being ruthlessly killed. However, when Sebus inquires if they should help the people of that city, he remembers back in the day when he was still a noob at the game. Everybody used to bully him, especially because he was one of the weak class, undead. Then there was one overdramatic hero named Touch Me who saved him. This hero was the same man who had created Sebus while he was at the guild alongside Momonga. Touch Me believed that it was their duty to save people who were in need, so in order to carry on his friend's legacy, Momonga decides to help out the village after all. He rises from his seat and tells Sebus to ask Albedo to join him when she can and leaves. Back on the outskirts of Karn village, two soldiers have surrounded a poor girl, Urn, and her younger sister after brutally finishing off their parents. They are about to do the same to the girls when suddenly their eyes widen as Momonga enters the area through a magical gate. Almost instantly, he uses a tier 13 magic which vaporizes one of the soldiers instantly. Disappointed, Momonga then fires a puny tier 5 magic and that too kills the remaining soldier in an instant. What surprises Momonga about this is not the fact that humans were so weak, but the fact that he felt no emotions while destroying them. As Albedo appears behind him, Momonga hands a red healing potion to the girl who has been wounded in the last battle and also hands her some cheap goblin summoning horns which could be used to help her when she needed. He then turns his attention to saving the village and casts a magic spell called Death Knight. Soon, the lifeless body of the man before him turns into a huge monstrous Death Knight and Momonga commands it to go and obliterate every single soldier in the village. And guess what? The monster does exactly that. Showing no mercy, the Death Knight slashes its huge sword through the crowd of soldiers, ripping their heads and plunging gaping holes into them until every last one of them is gone for good. When the chaos is over, Momonga appears before the crowd of villagers and reveals himself as the man who had saved them. He proudly announces his name, Ains Ulgaon, hoping that if there was anyone else who was stuck here from the game, someday they would find him since the name of Ains Ulgaon was pretty famous. Ains then manages to get a hold of the leader of the village, who surprisingly is still alive, and asks him for all the information of the world as a reward for saving the village from the soldier. The innocent village leader does just that and gives him all the information that he's got. Finally, after finishing with the payback bit, they bury the deceased. Ains has a ton of spells to bring back the dead, but he decides it's best not to draw more attention to himself. Just as he is about to leave, a group of warriors led by a man named Gazef encounter arrives at Karn village. Gazef introduces himself as the main warrior of the royal guard of Erantel, who had arrived there after recently encountering another sacked village. He has come there to protect the village from the knights who have been going around sacking village after village. However, what Gazef doesn't realize is that it's not the village the villains were after, but him. Nigun Grid Luin, a very sly sorcerer of some kind, has just received a 7th tier magic item from the leaders of the slain theocracy, whatever that is, to assassinate Gazef Stronoff and it was his soldier who was sacking villages luring the men into their trap. Nigun's men march onto Karn village with a team of magic casters to finish Gazef. Realizing this, Gazef attempts to convince Ains, since he had defeated an entire army earlier, to defend the village. However, Ains refuses to help him because he has no benefit in doing so. Regardless, the selfless man requests Ains to protect the villagers if he cannot protect him, to which Ains agrees. After all, he needed the villagers to live so that his name could be spread. 
Ains, however, takes a liking to Gazef and his personality and hands him an item before he heads into battle. Finally, Gazef and his men set out to confront the slain theocracy with all their might while Ains assists the villagers in escaping. Gazef and his men fight valiantly against the magical beasts that Ains recalls being weak monsters called Archangel Flames from the Idrisil game. These monsters barely even gave him XP anymore. At first, Gazef uses his martial arts ability to overpower the monster along with his men, but suddenly some more of them are summoned and Gazef and his men are heavily outnumbered and consequently defeated. Before Nagun's magic casters can deal the final blow, the item that Ains had previously given Gazef activates and swaps Ains and Albedo in place of Gazef on the battlefield. As soon as he appears, Ains warns his opponents to surrender if they wanted an easy release of their souls to the underworld, but the cocky villains think that the man was bluffing. Bad mistake. Immediately, Ains begins effortlessly battling away the attacks of Nigun's men, much to their shock, and why not? These losers haven't had someone to match or rather exceed their strength in a long while. When all of their so-called monster angels are finished, within seconds, Nigun has no choice but to activate a 7th tier spell given to him, summoning a powerful angel to attack Ains. The attack barely inflicts pain on Ains, which he scoffs about it. Dumbfounded and horrified at the power Ains displayed, Nigun begins to beg for his life. But the Overlord gives him what he deserves, a place in hell. After the battle is over, Ains returns back to Nazarek and announces his new name and their goal of spreading his new name, Ains Ol Gown, across these new lands. Out of context though, his servants misinterpret this as a declaration that he wishes to rule the world. When all that is done, Ains gives his orders to Sebus, the main NPC, and Shaltir to infiltrate the world and find and capture the strongest of men from around the whole world, while he himself heads to the city of Irentel along with one of the maidservants, Nabiral Gamma. Ains and Nabiral take on the aliases of Momen and Nabe, respectively, in order to join the Adventurer's Guild in the city of Irentel to learn more about the world. After successfully registering as adventurers, the two head to a local inn to spend the night where they almost already encounter trouble. The other adventurers try and intimidate them, but they are not that scary, and don't know who they are messing with. During the scuffle though, one of the other adventurers ends up having their potions broken, and she is super pissed. She comes in demanding a replacement. Nabe almost attacks her, but Momen stops her in time and hands the adventurer lady a red potion instead. The lady adventurer, Britta, is confused at what she has gotten and heads into the town to get it appraised. She heads straight to the local herbalist shop from where she usually buys her potions and meets with the shop owner Lizzie. The old shopkeeper instantly recognizes the potion as a true potion and tries to buy it off the adventurer. However, instead of buying the potion, she sends her grandson, Neferia, to find the person who made it and somehow learn to create it from them. At the guild, Momen and Nabe come across a group of adventurers called the Sword of Darkness. Cool name, but weak individuals. The only powerful one among them is the talent holder Ninya. The group asks Momen and Nabe to join their party for a mission, but just then, Momen is called to the counter as he had been requested for a private mission by none other than Neferia. Neferia is also a famous talent holder who can use any kind of magical item. So, the Sword of Darkness tell Momen that he should perhaps take Neferia's request instead. However, Momen tells them that they could join him in the job as well, since he had already joined their party. The request is simple, Neferia wanted to head to Karn village to gather some herbs and wanted protection from bandits who would come their way. As Momen and his party head to Karn village, a dangerous necromancer, Khajiit, and a bloodthirsty female assassin, Clementine, plot a takeover of Irentel. While on their way to the village, the party is attacked by a large group of goblins and ogres. They are, however, quick to adjust. A battle plan is made quickly. While the Swords of Darkness pick off the goblins, Momen and Nabe would eliminate the ogres. As the fight proceeds, Momen immediately breaks the formation and instantly obliterates several ogres single-handedly. Nabe follows his leads as well and shows off some third-tier magic, massacring several ogres and goblins while she is at it. The Sword of Darkness realized that these two aren't just some ordinary copper-level adventurers, their level was far higher than that. The other goblins and ogres panic and retreat at the sight of Momen cutting down their kin. After this, the whole group gathers around to collect the body parts of the deceased monster to later collect the reward. 
Back at Irintel, Clementine and Khajiit's plan to take over the city has already started to begin, as they have already managed to gain the crown of wisdom, which could be used to create a massive horde of zombies for their army. Their scheme was taking shape. Momin's group finally arrives at Karn Village, which seems to have become something totally different since the last time Momin visited it as Ains. Ern used the goblin horn that Ains had given her, and now a horde of really intelligent and powerful zombies protected the village. They even apprehend Momin and the gang from entering the village until Ern shows up and lets them in. Neferia has always had a crush on Ernie and frequently visited the village to meet her, but this visit was after he had learned of the attack. Neferia expresses his condolences to the girl, but Henry has already vowed to be strong for her little sister and doesn't look back at what happened with hatred. She tells Neferia why the village is fortified, and she also mentions Ain's old gown, the red potion that healed her, which leads Neferia to conclude that Momin is Ain's old gown. Neferia quickly rushes to Momin, aka Ains, and thanks him for saving the girl he loved. He also apologizes for deceiving him and reveals his true purpose for hiring Ains on the journey. Ains is not angry, but tells him not to reveal his identity to anyone. The next day, Neferia requests the Swords of Darkness along with Momin and Nabe to help him collect medical herbs in the forest. As the whole group arrives at the entrance to the forest, Momin learns of the Wise King of the Forest, a supposedly powerful magical creature. Seeing an opportunity to gain fame, Momin contacts Aura back in Nazarick and has her draw out the beast from its den. As the group enters the forest, strange noises start to scare them senseless, and Momin heads to check it out, knowing all too well that it's the supposed beast that he needed to defeat. From the depths of the forest, the beast angrily runs out and charges Momin. However, much to his disappointment, Momin immediately recognizes the beast as a giant Jungarian hamster, a species that one of his guildmates kept as a pet in real life. Realizing that it would be too much of an embarrassment to slaughter such a helpless and weak monster, Momin instead opts to use one of his skills to scare the beast into submission. He decides to make the king his servant instead. Naming the wise king Hamsuke, he then heads outside on the hamster's back and introduces Hamsuke to the Swords of Darkness who are in awe. More importantly, they are not scared of it either, so that does make it a bit awkward for Hamsuke. All of the members of the Sword of Darkness are in awe at the creature's glory since it's very renowned throughout the world. Momin, however, is floored by their perception of Hamsuke, as he cannot see her as anything other than a giant cute hamster. Anyways, after successfully collecting the herbs, the group returns to Irentel. Momin and Nabe then part ways with the group to register Hamsuke, while the Swords of Darkness return to the pharmacy for their payment from Neferia's grandmother. As the Sword of Darkness escorts Neferia, almost expecting a happy end to their journey, Clementine appears in front of them. The psychopathic woman is not at all subtle with her plans and boldly declares that she wanted to kidnap Neferia. The Swords of Darkness attempt to buy time for Neferia and Ninja to escape, but Khajiit blocks their way of escape. There was only one way of escape, fight. Elsewhere, after registering Hamsuke at the Adventurer's Guild, Momin and Nabe meet Lizzie who guides them to her house. However, something is wrong. The sound of silence is all too creepy for a moment to handle. He quickly grabs his sword and heads into the storage room alongside Nabe, where they find the Swords of Darkness turned into zombies. He quickly finishes the three men and notices a mutilated body of Ninya lying there, with Neferia nowhere to be seen. Momin knows whoever did it did not hide the bodies, meaning they did not care to cover their tracks. Second, a piercing weapon was used to kill the swords, and finally, since nothing else except Neferia was taken, their target must have been Neferia. With this knowledge, Momin asks Lizzie if she wants to hire him to save her grandson. He knows he is confident that he can save Neferia from his abductors, but Lizzie would have to give him everything she had as a reward. With no other option, Lizzie agrees to the pseudo-Faustian contract. Momin then puts his hand through a literal hole in the space-time continuum and pulls out several scrolls like a literal badass. He then commands Nabe, explaining to her the order of the spells she has to use to track down Neferia. They manage to track down Clementine to an old cemetery on the edge of town. Using Crystal Monitor, Momin discovers an undead army with Neferia at its center, which makes him realize that there was going to be a zombie attack soon. He orders Lizzie to alert the guild and town and immediately rushes to the cemetery. At the cemetery gates, the guards are having a chill time when one of them suddenly notices the horde of zombies coming their way. 
that's when they realize that this might probably be the last night of their lives. Fortunately for them, Momin and Nabe arrive in time to save them from the zombies. The two literally take down an entire army of zombies and reach the place where Nefria is being held. Outside the shady temple, Khajiit is performing some ritual with his minions, while Clementine sits like a villain in the shadows of one of the pillars. To make the fight even, Momin decides to take on the psychopath Clementine while Nabe takes on Khajiit and his minions. Nabe, even while restraining her powers, very much takes out all of Khajiit's minions in a flash, so the old Voldemort sympathizer pulls up his trump card, a literal skeletal dragon. This beast was supposedly immune to all forms of magic, which meant that Nabe was in a really big disadvantage. Or, well, she wasn't. The woman is still powerful enough that she can literally counter the skeleton and chill while she is at it. On the other hand, Momin is having a great time as well, because Clementine is really cocky and that is always going to have her dead. She boasts that only Gazef would probably be able to beat her and tells Momin that he should run while he is still able to. Momin is astounded at the girl's claims and offers up a counterclaim to fight her handicapped. Their battle begins as well. Back with Nabe and my man Khajiit is so desperate that he summons not one but two skeletal dragons. This time though, Nabe has a bit of an issue until she hears the words from her master to unleash her full potential. Nabe then gets rid of her uniform and, like a Power Ranger, transforms into her maid form. She then proves the whole skeletal dragons are immune to magic hoax wrong. Yes, they were immune to magic, but only up to 6th tier magic, and Nabe had access to magic way above that level. Nabe easily obliterates both the dragons and Khajiit with a 7th tier spell. Momin, continuing to give Clementine a handicap, clashes with her repeatedly. Furious at how Momin repeatedly mocks her as weak, Clementine charges Momin with a full force attack and stabs him in both eyes with elemental strikes. Momin brushes off the move to Clementine's shock and pins her with a one-armed bear hug. Revealing his true nature as an undead, Ains torments Clementine that she was defeated by a magic caster that did not even use magic. Visibly shaken, Clementine snaps and flails relentlessly while thrashing at Ains to release her. Her efforts prove futile, and Ains crushes her body with both arms, killing her. Ains then returns victorious with Narborl, Amsuke, and Neferia, and for his efforts is immediately promoted to Mithril rank. Elsewhere, on her mission, Shaltir is outside Nazarek, trying to find martial arts users with Sebus and Solution, another one of the maids from Nazarek. Solution has been pretending to be a lady of a huge house and attracting unwanted attention through which the others have been gathering info and, more importantly, prisoners. On their way to another town, they almost immediately encounter some bandits. The poor bandits don't know, however, that it is their deaths they have stopped and not some poor helpless lady who they can rob. Shaltir steps out the carriage and her vampire women immediately crash and brutally split every man standing nearby. Shaltir, on the other hand, sends Sebus and Solution back to the kingdom and goes to the bandit's base, where she confronts their leader, Brain Unglaus, who knows martial arts. However, he is so weak compared to her that she does not even realize that he is using martial arts. The poor guy's entire life's training is proven worthless when his main attack is literally countered by her pinky fingernail. If that doesn't break a man, <laughs> I don't know what will. After scaring the poor lad away, she then goes into blood frenzy and kills all of the bandits except Brain, who escapes. She tries to follow him, but encounters some other adventurers, and decides, well, while she is at it, why not slaughter some innocent bystanders as well? Shaltir kills all of them one by one until she reaches Britta, who is so dumbfounded and scared that she throws a literal potion at the vampire. Luckily for her, the potion was the same one given to her by Ains, which makes Shaltir believe that Ains wanted her alive. She takes the adventurer prisoner and extracts information from her when she realizes that one adventurer was set to run away. She tries to find him, but ends up being attacked by some unknown people who bring out some god-tier weapon and attack her with it, turning the whole dark area into a bright white light. Elsewhere, as he discusses his new promotion with Narborol, Ains contacts Albedo, who alerts him that Shaltir Bloodfallen has rebelled against Nazarek. Ains returns back to the Nazarek in a state of panic. If this could happen to one NPC, it could happen to all of them. He tells Albedo to raise the security of the guild to the maximum, and then asks her to track the true vampire's whereabouts. At the same time, all Mithereal adventurers are summoned as well to deal with this unknown vampire who slaughtered tons of adventurers only last night. 
Haynes realizes that this was Shaltier and volunteers to take her down himself, but not everyone in the room trusts the guy who literally jumped from the lowest level to the highest one in a day. One other adventurer also decides to accompany Ains and ends up dying at Ains's hands as Mare strikes the man to his death. Ains then heads to the location where Shaltier was standing lifeless like a puppet. Ains attempts to use a super tier magic item to free her, but it fails, making him realize that there were god tier magic items in this world as well. He quickly falls back with Albedo and heads back to Nazarick to become well prepared for what is about to come next. Ains then takes Albedo to the treasure room which is guarded by the NPC that he created Pandora's actor. There he realizes just how lame he was, or actually the lame phase that he was going through when he created the NPC. Pandora's actor was truly the epitome of cringe. Fortunately, he doesn't have to suffer any more of Pandora's rubbish and quickly grabs the world-class items in the guild and equips the floor guardian NPCs with them to protect them before he goes to fight Shaltier but he also states that Shaltier is one of the strongest NPCs in Nazarick and that he might not be able to beat her. After all the preparations are done, Ains heads into the first major battle of his life in this new world. With all the other floor guardians watching, Ains was not just battling for victory, but also for his honor as the leader of Nazarick. He could have sent any one of the other NPCs to do the work for him, but Ains didn't want them to fight amongst themselves because in them, he saw his friends. Ains reaches and challenges Shaltier to a battle, but she doesn't respond until she is attacked, just like in the games. So, Ains decides to pull up the epic meme and stacks himself with hundreds of spells in preparation for the battle. The entire scene takes more than two minutes, that's how many spells he adds. The battle then finally commences. Shaltier has no idea why, but she reveals that she needs to attack Ains. She was probably brainwashed by the god tier weapon. The battle rages and Ains and Shaltier seem to be on par with each other's moves. However, Shaltier is still an NPC and her moves and mindset is limited to what she is designed for. Despite this, Shaltier gives one hell of a fight to Ains, who even has to use his special move, the goal of all life is death. The move doesn't defeat Shaltier, but I just mentioned it because it sounds so cool. Ains and Shaltier Bloodfallen continue their fight. However, it is revealed that the outcome of their fight was already predicted by Ains. He had used the oldest skill that humans had invented to defeat Shaltier lying. Ains had purposely been telling her his weakness and the lack of it and luring her using fake data. Using the knowledge about Shaltier, provided by her creator and his friend Peroroncino, he had the whole battle pre-planned. So, even though Shaltier thought that Ains was probably out of his depth, he was just getting started. Now, tell me if that isn't badass. F in the chat to pay respect to Mega Chad Ains Ulgaon Sama. Anyways, with his MP reduced, Ains changes to a warrior class and uses the world champion armor, Perfect Warrior. Ains then exploits the fact that he had been playing Yggdrasil maniacally for the past years and pulls out one cash shop item after another. He finally uses a super tier spell, Fallen Down, which finally kills Shaltier. With the NPC defeated, Ains returns back at Nazarek. Ains then gathers all his servants in the treasure room and tells them his plan to resurrect Shaltier using the gold that they had. He tells them to kill Shaltier if she awakens still under command of the god tier magic. Then, he resurrects Shaltier using 500 million gold. Thankfully, Shaltier is out of the spell, but has no memory of her time under mind control. With everything set back to normal, Momin and Nabe return to the guild to look for a new job, and it is shown that he has been promoted directly to Adamantine class, making them the third Adamantite party in the kingdom. That's it for season 1, 3000 likes and I'll know you guys want season 2. Thanks for watching!